There's the recording. Okay, we are, we have started the recording and I see we have a quorum. So good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us, including some long distance uh, wireless travelers who have joined us, um, Angelica. So my, my first order is to make sure that everyone can hear and be heard. And then I will be turning it over to Margaret, who will just give us a, a brief overview of today's agenda. And we've also had some questions and answers, and she may be summarizing that as well. So um, as I call out your name, please just indicate whether you can hear and be heard. Sean? Yes. Jonathan? Yes. Mike? Yes. Paul? Yes. Phoebe? Yes. Uh, Angelica? Yes, and greetings from Ecuador. <laughs> Alicia? Yes. Simone? Yes. Ben? Yes. Okay, so we, we are missing a few people, but I think we will start since we have, um, uh, and, and as they come in, I will make sure they can hear and be heard. And I'll just keep checking to make sure that it doesn't end up that they somehow ended up in the audience rather than with us. Uh, so Margaret, I'm gonna just turn it over to you to lay out the day. Um, yep, and I apologize. I I came in as an audience member, not as a panelist originally. So I'm going to pull up the agenda. Can everybody see that? Yes, I, okay. I, well, I'll answer for me. I can see it. <laughs> so probably other speak, speak up if you can. So um, we're going to the, the big item today is obviously that we're going to talk about the cost estimates, but there are a couple of other things um, that we also need to take up. Um, Danisco is going to talk about um, uh, some phasing diagrams that they made for the school, uh, the timeline for the project. This is in your know, response to questions. In fact, Phoebe, I think you were the first one to put this in writing was to say, like, can I see how this is going to work, how a construction project is going to work on the site. Um, we're going to revisit uh, the criteria matrix in anticipation of Monday's meeting, which is will not involve a presentation, but we'll have a discussion. And then we're going to just look forward to the decision making that is coming, because we're now at the point that the content has all been provided and we need to figure out which is the best option. And as I said in my cover memo yesterday, uh, yesterday, a couple of days ago, if you read it, you know, this, it's, it's not, this isn't, there's not a clear cut decision here. And so the discussion is really important. Um, I want to, in terms of questions that we had, I'm going to take this down for a minute. There was, there had been, I thought a really good question about um, the distance, the question about how far students are walking and how many students are walking. Now, as um, I think Mike noted at a previous meeting, uh, I think busing is provided to everyone. Mike, is that correct? But the district did have some data. There's a small number of students who, who um, live very close to the school where there's no uh, dangerous intersection that we don't, but the, uh, just about everybody, well over 90% of our students are offered uh, bus transportation and it depends on some of the schools, some of the, the kids who live in the neighborhood of Wildwood, there, there are some safe yep. intersection sidewalks uh, at our other schools, less so. Um, yeah, there's a neighborhood behind Crocker Farm that has safe ways, but Fort River is a little tougher because it's surrounded by major roads. So the vast, yep. vast majority of students, even if they're within our legal guidelines of who we have to transport, we transport many, many more students because of what we would agree are dangerous intersections. Yeah. And, you know, I think this um, very brief chart kind of tells the story, which is, you know, Wildwood is in a more residential neighborhood. So there are, you know, more kids who could walk within um, the under one mile distance and quite a few under the one and a half mile. But the reality, I think, is because they're elementary school kids, most of these kids are coming either on the bus or with a parent, right? Yeah. 
So does anybody have any questions about that before I take it down? Okay, so seeing none, I'm gonna take this down. And um, going back to um, the content that Denisco is gonna present, I, we thought that it might make the best sense because we think the most questions will come from the cost estimate information to, for um, the Denisco team to review the um, phasing diagrams, which were in, included in the distribution, but uh, Donna, Tim, and Rick will walk us through them. So why don't we start with that, and then we'll toggle to looking at the cost estimates. So I just want to make sure Tammy can hear and be heard. She has joined us. Hi, Tammy. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, and Rupert's with us too. Hi, Rupert. Hi, sorry I'm a little late, but I'm here. No, you're here. Thanks. Okay, so if is that where we just want to talk about the phasing diagrams then? Yeah. Okay, Tim, why don't you take it take it away? Sure. I'm going to share my screen. Um, just as a context for uh, all the phasing diagrams that we're going to walk through. Uh, these are preliminary based on the designs as they are evolved or not evolved now. So obviously everything can change, but um, they both have new construction options uh, with the building complete uh, by June of 2026. Um, there will be site work continuing into the fall of 26, but the building will be um, available and ready for the start of school in the fall of 2026. With the renovation addition options, um, that construction schedule is pushed out to the spring of 2027. Um, and then there might even be final planting and final site work in the summer of 27. But um, that's just an overall view of the difference of the schedule between new construction and renovation addition. Um, Starting on the Fort River site with a renovation and addition option, uh, the building itself will be constructed and renovated in two major phases. Uh, here we show the initial phase, which will demolish uh, the existing physical plant, kitchen, kindergarten, administration suite of the building and replace it with a new addition. Um, the shaded area is the area that will be controlled by the contractor. Um, it will all be fenced off. Access from children and anyone else on site will be controlled. Um, there will be separate entrances to the site for school and contractor vehicles, um, typically, and as will be the case here, contractor vehicles will not be able to access the site for a window during drop off and pick up to just make sure that everything is separated. Um, because the initial phase of the building is the main electric room, the kitchen, and the boiler room, um, there will be some operational changes that have to happen during the occupied school that's going on while construction is happening. Uh, the way we've priced it out, there's a temporary boiler and chiller for the facility. Um, students will likely have to eat in their rooms as they have been doing with COVID. Um, and then, you know, since some of the spaces are being demolished, there will be some shuffling that has to happen with classrooms, gym, library. Um, but this initial phase will start in August of 24 and continue to mid-year or January 2026. And as part of the initial phase, all of the mechanical systems that will be required for a functioning school will have to be installed, including the geothermal well field. So then in January of 2026, it shifts to phase two. The new addition will be complete. Uh, students, sorry, there's a probably some background noise you can hear. Um, um, the contractor fence will shift, uh, closing off a new part of the site. Um, the fields completed to the southern half of the site will be accessible for school use with a new drop-off loop. And then 
with all of the students occupying and uh, learning in the new building, the existing part will be renovated. And this will bring us to the spring of 2027. And then there's an additional third phase that will complete the site work that will be happening throughout the entire construction process, beginning in the summer of 24, continuing in the summer of 25, and when students are not on site, and probably going into the fall of 2026. So the lines of delineation on a new construction project are a little clearer, uh, obviously, since you're not in the building that is occupied. So uh, the overall concept is similar, but you're outside of the building. So there is a fenced off contractor area to the south of the site that allows them to complete the building. Um, during this time, obviously, the fields will not be accessible, but behind the fence on the southern portion of the site, um, a completely functional building, including fields, um, drop off loops that were, are within the construction area and the geothermal well field will be completed by June of 2026. And then a second sh shorter phase um, from June of 26 into the fall will be the completion of the site to the north, demolition of the existing building and playgrounds and athletic fields on the northern part of the site. And as with the renovation and addition option, the new construction parking will be completed in phases as it is available to the contractor um, over summers and during the project. Moving to Wildwood, um, conceptually, it's gonna work the same way, uh, but without the same amount of room, it's slightly more complicated and the, the pieces are a little closer to each other. Again, we have a first phase that takes half of the building, demolishes it and reconstructs it. Um, you have the same separation of contractor traffic, school traffic and space with on the site. Um, it is a little bit tighter. So the construction fence will be closer to the occupied building on one side and the well field will be constructed closer to the building that is occupied. Some of these operations are noisy and there are options for noise mitigating fences that we would have to um, look into as the design is developed. Again, the second phase is the other half of the site. Um, the access flips from school to contractor uh, but the remainder of the building after the first half is constructed is renovated and completed. With the smaller site at Wildwood, there will most likely have to be a time when um, this area shown here will have to be off limits to school. Um, the reason that is, is there's not enough area to do everything in a linear fashion, uh, most likely there will have to be in this small area temporary parking during phase two because there's not enough space outside of the footprint of the building and the contractor area to accommodate all the parking. So during phase one, there will probably have to be some temporary parking configuration on that side. And then again on phase two, simply because the Wildwood site is smaller and can't accommodate all of the parking while either one of the phases is happening. Moving to new construction on Wildwood, similar to Fort River, um, outside of the building, you'll notice that you are adjacent to the building rather than to the south of it on Wildwood. The well field is constructed within the contractor area, which allows the building to be new and fully operational for the June of 2026 and opening in the fall of 2026. Phase two again is demolition of the existing building, completion of the site, including play space, outdoor learning, parking. And then a final phase to put the site in its final condition, reconfigure any temporary parking that has to happen, 
and complete the site. Yeah, so, so why don't we um, just open it up to questions? I'm sure people have some. Sean? Yeah, so uh, two questions. Under, under either site, are there opportunities to use other town properties to, for lay down areas and to try to minimize the contractor area? And I guess because this might be more for Mike, for the Wildwood um, option, where would the kids, I guess, go outside, do recess, things like that during that two year span when um, the school's being built? I can answer the first part about the availability, well, whether or not offsite area would help. I mean, it would certainly help for lay down area. Um, the closer it is, the better. Um, if the fields at the middle school were available, that would certainly ease the congestion and the complexity of the phasing at Wildwood. Uh, it wouldn't necessarily speed up the schedule any, but um, all of the elements that have to happen would have that much more room. Um, and they would most likely be less issues. A, um, a, a small, Tim, a small first step toward offsite might be parking where contractor parking could be offsite and a contractor arrange a, a shuttle if it's a distance away from the site that happens quite often on in, impinged sites and helps because you could have 75 to 100 uh, workers at the height of construction. And, and I think just to respond to the play areas um, for both, I, it's going to be tight. And if you just go back to phase one, I guess, Tim. Um, we have in the past, we've, you know, put down temporary play areas for kids. Um, you know, it's going to be tight parking, although we'll have the sixth graders out. So, you know, maybe we take a portion of the play of the parking area for some play and make it a safe, you know, put barriers, et cetera, up. But um, there's absolutely going to be challenges on both sites, but more so on Wildwood as it relates to uh, recess and outdoor play during the construction. The, the other thing too, which we haven't spoken about is um, we might be able to do some site enabling packages um, prior to August. So maybe the contractor can come in or, or a separate contractor, if it's a hard bid, um, we can do site enabling, put up the fence before August, maybe do some prep for some temporary play space or whatever on the other side so that when the students come back end of August or September, there's everything's in place. I see three hands. Angelica's was up. I don't see it up right now, but Phoebe, Jonathan, Angelica all had their hands up. Phoebe? Um, can you actually go down one slide to phase two for me? Um, okay, I, I, I'm trying to get some clarity. So it looks to me, if I'm looking at these dates right, that there's not going to be, if we choose Wildwood, that there wouldn't be realistic play space available until fall of 27. Um, am I looking at these dates correct? Because that's quite a bit longer than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be the year prior. Um, so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, Someone else doesn't like that either, Fifi. <laughs> but, okay, but I hey, have a. <laughs> so, so they have that. Um, you know, I, I, we can. Um, you know, they, these are all uh, preliminary. Where we put the play areas for the kids, typically, 
you know, we try to put them a little closer, you know, the playgrounds themselves a little closer to the site, et cetera. But um, yeah, I, th they will, pro everything will not be 100% complete and the kids will have to have additional temporary play areas for both phases. Uh, and again, though, you know, this is temporary. Do we move the play areas closer to the building so that they're full and up for phase two? That that's certainly a possibility. And then I also I did hear I did hear um, the idea of having them of having play areas at the middle school. And then my question, if that were even a possibility, which I don't know that I've heard whether it is or isn't, but if it is, how would we then um, ensure that all children could access that space because it is down, you know, that steep hill. Um, you, using the middle school playgrounds would require some sort of universal access to it. And as we've discussed, uh, that's not an easy thing. Or, or an inexpensive endeavor. No. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Jonathan and then Angelica. So that answered part, part of my question. Um, I, so, but I had a, another little piece, which was about the parking in Wildwood. Um, it looked like the final parking wasn't until uh, summer of 2027, um, but that, that really can be done in the summer and, and it wouldn't disturb the, the, the students during the spring uh, semester. Question mark. <laughs> um. To the extent that it can be answered with the design as they're developed now, it, it doesn't appear that the final parking in any way that we have laid out can be part of a single phase early in the process. There's just not enough space to put 175, which is the count that we're working with now. And then to allow the area to, for the contractor to do all the work that they have to do, including the well field. So, and, and then in the final design, you want separation of bus and car traffic. And so to get all those pieces where they need to be in the final situation, what most likely will happen is while there will be a temporary parking situation that is in at the final drop-off loop, say, and, and then during that final phase that will have to be converted to its final condition. Um, so, but to add to that um, too, Jonathan, we don't need 175 during construction, right? We, we just need enough for the existing school uh, faculty. But, and, and again, um, you know, preliminary plans, we, we certainly will spend more time looking at these once we have a direction as to which site and which option. But, you know, um, we've heard comments that People were commenting about the curved parking, et cetera. So, so we would need to dig into it deeper, but we don't need 175 during construction, but it, it still will be a um, inconvenience. No question. Angelica. Uh, yes, I was wondering if you can talk more about the, the traffic situation. Um, uh, I just looking at these um, charts that I noticed that the spaces for the construction, the contractor egress and the traffic egress are smaller in Fort River um, and Fort River already has significant traffic issues. So I'm just wondering uh, what are the plans for um, dealing with uh, increased traffic issues or traffic patterns during the time of construction? A plan for site access will have to be developed, including times that contractors can and cannot access the site, um, in, including where and where they cannot access the site during all phases. Um, and that is certainly something that will have to be developed. But um, it is true that there are limited ways that you can access the Fort River site. And you know the northern exit um, is um, close to the intersection of Main and East Street. So a lot of traffic there turning is creates issues. So um, there certainly will be impacts during construction on either site um, that will have to be studied and mitigated to the extent that possible. But during the extent of construction, um, 
it, it will not operate as perfectly, not to say that it operates perfectly now, as, as well as it does. There's, yeah, there, there can be no confusion that there will be impacts on traffic. Phoebe. Um, so I wanted to go back to the temporary parking briefly, um, but we, we will need all of the parking, you know, 175 spaces or whatever it is, as of fall 26, because that's when the new building would open on either site, right? So is that temporary parking that, that we were looking at, especially at Wildwood, enough to accommodate everybody as of fall 26? We, the reason that it's shown as temporary is that it would have to be in some way made to accommodate everybody, even if that is not where the final design dictates it should be. Um, so yes, absolutely. And, and maybe it's some other accommodation, uh, which we haven't studied yet, but um, there absolutely has to be at the day that the building opens parking for everybody. Um, Tim, can you go to the next, can you go to the next slide? So, right, I think this is where you're saying the hang up is here, Phoebe, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah again, um, trying to navigate how this all plays out, you know, there won't, we, we would have to figure out uh, there, there may be itinerant staff uh, that we're going to have to address or whatever. So um, we would have to take a hard look on, on absolutely what is required. And that demarcation line between the contractor area and the school area may have to change. This is a preliminary diagram based on the design that we have now. If what we have identified as temporary parking in this is not enough, that red line is going to have to move to the north and make sure that the school can function when it opens. Okay, and can you guys tell me um, for both sites, what is the um, what is the date that the contractors will be offsite? So everything completed and everybody out, so that you know the school is kind of whole again. For a new construction. It will most likely be the fall of 26 with maybe some final planting, but this, they wouldn't be mobilized with fences, trailers in the spring of 27. And then uh, if it's renovation addition, it would probably extend the final and into the summer of 27. Is that for both schools or one or the other? Because I think that for is, Wildwood, we had summer of 27, if I'm looking at this correctly. For renovation addition, yes. But the schedule is similar for both sites. It's the, the real variable in the schedule is the construction method, whether it's renovation addition or new construction. Okay. Jonathan. Just to clarify that last point, uh, occupancy of the new building in either new construction looks like it's, you know, by August of, of 26, but complete, you know, close out of the contract is different on both sites, correct? It look, you know, if you're not finishing the, the parking on Wildwood until summer of 27, you're, you're, there's still an engagement by the contractor. Um, that is correct. Um, just to clarify, though, on fall of 26, uh, in a renovation addition, the school will be continuously occupied, um, but you may not be redistricting until the following year uh, because there is a renovation happening into the fall of 26. So the consolidation of, so if it's at Fort River, Wildwood might still be operating in the fall of 26. Yeah, can you can you go to a Averino slide? All right, one more. There you go. So the as you can see, right? So the new building 
the new addition is where we moved the students in. And um, we then would wrap up the construction of the entire phase, we're saying probably uh, January, well, the renovate the existing classroom in January of 2026 through uh, spring of 27. So we wouldn't be bringing, right, Tim? Can you yes. go to the next? We have that correct? Correct. So if we wouldn't the... be moving everyone in until the mm -hmm. entire building is complete. So the transition have... from phase one to phase two in a renovation addition would happen before completion in a new construction scheme. Um, but final, if you want to call that occupancy of the 575 students would not happen until after fall right. of 26. So that would be fall, that would be fall of 27. We would wrap up the site work, uh, mm -hmm. wrap up, right? So this phase would take us through spring of 27. And then if you go to the last slide on this, Tim, the next slide, um, this would be during the summer. So it would be, we would have everything ready to roll by fall of 27 for all of the students. BB. Sorry, I, there's a lot to unpack here. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of questions I have. Um, so that's for uh, an ad reno. For the new though, I thought it was the same time frame for Wildwood and I'd like to take these separately, Wildwood and Fort River. Um, I, it, can we go to that phase three new for Wildwood and then? Okay, so there's still a piece of this that is happening summer 27. So it'll be at the end of the summer 27 that officially everybody is off site. Yes. Okay. And then is that the same for Fort River? No. Okay. What is it for Fort River? It would, it would be the fall of 26, there might be some lingering planting. There's always somebody fixing somebody yeah. into the spring, but it would be the okay. fall of 26. Okay. And then Tim, you had mentioned that, and I want to, I, I, I would like you to repeat it because I'm not sure that I understood or got what you said, mm -hmm. that if it was at Wildwood, there may be the instance where in, in, tw in the fall of 26, kids would still be at the separate schools or... I, I wasn't sure what you said there, and it was something that I had not heard before. So I'd like to clarify that so that we understand what you're saying. You're saying for the new construction, Phoebe. Yep. Yeah. She's focused on new. Yep. Yeah. So Tim, when you <laughs> no for renovation addition, the entire consolidated population of the two schools would not be at the construction type until fall of 27. For new construction at Wildwood all 575 students would be there in the fall of 26, but there would be ongoing work. Through that school year. Okay. All right. Yes. I, I thank you. I, I wanted to make sure that I had that <laughs> very well, clear in my mind. There, there are literally a lot of moving parts here. So yes, absolutely. Thanks. So I, I think we should, could then move to costs, um, costs. <laughs> uh, uh, how much would we like to spend on all of this? Um, how much you would like to spend or? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how much, unfortunately, this is uh, costing out. All right. Um, so, Margaret, I don't know if you want to touch on this. I think um, the cover sheet addressed some of this that was sent out the other day, but um, I guess just two, a, a few comments. One is um, we had, oh God, I'm sorry. Um, one is that we had two cost estimators. Um, they're both third party. Denis Goh's cost estimator, who is the 
official cost estimator for the project is A.M. Fogarty and Answer hired um, PMC, who's also a well-known, reputable third-party cost estimator who also does a lot of public school work. Um, the reason why we're selecting A.M. Fogarty is because for lots of contractual reasons, et cetera, but they're Denisco's and the designer's um, cost estimator of record. Um, so just, you know, real briefly, I think there's a lot of detail. I think this is what people were looking for at PDP, and you can see why we wouldn't have that information during PDP. But again, this is also preliminary in the fact that we really haven't designed or started to design the school. Uh, we, we did go through the basis of design so everyone can understand how that now ties to the detail behind the summary sheets. Hopefully that's a little more helpful and clear. I think we have a really good handle on the site. Um, whichever site is, is selected, we will do some additional testing on the site just to reconfirm everything. But I, I think the site has been developed well beyond uh, study phase, just so that we can have a really good handle on the costs. And we thank all of you for asking the tough questions. Um, um, Donna, can I just pause a second? I want to make, Allison has joined us and I just want to make sure she oh, can sure. And here so we can welcome Allison. Hello, okay. thank you. Okay, great. Continue. Great. Yeah, um, so uh, with that, I, I think, um, and then the, the total project budget, which um, I'm not sure if, I, I don't think we've gotten to that point yet to break out what MSBA share is compared to what the town share is. But for now, what we'd like to do is just go through, I think these slides are familiar with everyone. We did bring up the PVs and the ground source into the cost estimate above, and then the contractor markups are below. We still need to work out what's the best way to expedite and um, bid both the PVs, if it makes sense to do it from a, a separate individual contractor, or fold it into the general contractor's work here, and then the ground source heat pumps or the well field um, as well. But we did continue to break those out just so that people could see them. Um, I think pretty much everything should be self-explanatory. The site work did increase over at Wildwood based on the additional information and understanding the topography, et cetera. Over there, the site work does not include any work um, down at the middle school fields. And then I think we just the costs have increased since we have uh, since PDP. So in two months, um, the costs have increased. We are still carrying 12% for design contingency. I think everyone could see that on the cover sheets. And then we've made uh, certain assumptions for the general conditions and markups as it relates to the duration of each of the options. And we're still carrying a percent for art in there. And so you can see down below the total uh, construction cost for each of the options. And then if you go to the next slide, Um, and and these, these costs right here, as we're showing them, are for uh, CM at risk. And what we're doing as far as the total project cost is we're just taking a multiplier of 25 um, for 1.25 based on the total construction cost, which still will need to be vetted a little bit further, but it also includes contingencies. And then if we went um, to a design bid bill, chapter 149 or a hard bid with a general contractor versus a CM, as we've talked about a renovation addition is really not a candidate for that just given the complexities and the safety of the staff and the students. So we're not recommending a design bid build for that. And you can see what we did was 
um, again, we're saying the cost estimators are saying, and, and we support it, that design bid build is approximately 8% less of, of a CM. So there is no necessarily backup to those numbers other than the cost estimators just took a 8% discount across the board for uh, DBB. So maybe it's a, I, I yep. let you all talk. Uh, Sean, why don't you go first and then I'll ask my question. Yeah, I was just gonna see, um, Donna, do you still feel that design bid build is is a fine option for the new three-story? I think you said you do, but is, you know, given how much uh, less expensive it could be, um, I just wanna make sure you, you all are super comfortable with that option um, if it's a new construction. Yeah, we, we, we fully support that, Sean. Um, and again, you know, there are still ways that we can try to get ahead of the construction, recognizing we want our documents as detailed and complete as possible. We can do early site enabling packages as well um, to kind of tee up the site, both from a putting up construction fencing, et cetera, but we could do a lot of that work over the first summer. Yeah, I'm going to chime in here and say I agree with Donna and Tim and Rick. You know, I think that the new construction options are totally doable as design bid build. Um, I think there we will still need to have a discussion about the pros and cons of CM at risk, and it's not a decision you need to make at this point. Um, but there are, you know, there are there are some advantages with a project of a lot of complexity, and I think one of the things when we get to it, we'll be talking about is some of the challenges right now of procuring equipment and materials, um, given the supply chain issues that can be helped through a CM process, but it's not, it's not a decision for today. And, and I think it's, this is an excellent way of presenting this because of what it tells you is that gives you a kind of across the board version of this, and then it tells you that there may be some savings in using design bid build, but we don't, again, we don't have to decide about it today. Um, jo Jonathan, I'm, I'm gonna wait just to make sure that I don't preempt someone else. So Jonathan and then Phoebe. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so I know you don't have the, uh, the information, but I've got two, two questions, which I'll try to ask quickly. Um, I know you don't have you know, the official numbers on what will be the town share. I'm just curious, would it vary or is it likely to be the same number, um, relatively speaking, uh, between the sites? And then the second question is, um, there were some potential offsite costs associated with uh, the traffic report is that work in this number? And if it's not, will we get to see that? Um, Cause that will, you know, part of what we're gonna end up talking about on, on, at the next meeting is, you know, probably cost and, and how these are impacting our own individual decisions. So I'd, I'd like to know all the costs if we can, and maybe we do. Wow, uh, sure. Tim, do you wanna go to the last? Yeah. So um, Jonathan, to your point, and thank you, um, at one point we had the offsite improvements as part of this. And then I think we were, everyone was saying, no, that's a distraction, take them off. So um, here we are. So we have developed, these are kind of, we have had PAR engineering help weigh in on the signalization and the cost of the signalizations and uh, the cost estimators priced out the lane widening over at Fort River and the roundabout based on PARS diagrams over on Strong Street. So you can see they're relatively close. Um, does this, you know, solve the world's problems? You know, no, I think we would need to dive deeper to make sure that everyone's on board with these recommendations. This is helpful to have though, it gives me an understanding of the of the, of the of the larger impact. Thanks. Phoebe. 
Um, I, I mean, I want to say that, first of all, I'm kind of encouraged that these are uh, kind of as close as they are. Um, I think it's, I think that, yes, these are much better numbers than we had had originally. Um, it makes it a little more real, which is nice. Um, I wouldn't I'm, say better, Phoebe. These are, these prices have gone up, but yeah. Well, no, but they're, I mean, better closer. in terms of, they're closer. It, <laughs> yeah. Well, and it, it feels like, uh, more real, if you will. <laughs> I don't know that I'm explaining it well, but that's what I meant by that. Um, so I know that we had discussed briefly at one point that there may be, it looks like the biggest difference um, still is site work, um, the fields uh, at Fort River, that kind of stuff. So I know that we had discussed the possibility of getting some additional or other funding for pieces of that. None of that is built into this, correct? This is all... This is, on, wow. yeah, we're not, there's no, there's no, it, the cost is still the cost. How, how you fund it is different. Right. Okay. Right. All right. Um, okay. Go ahead, Kathy. I'll re-raise if I have questions. Okay. Well, you, you segued into what I want to ask about uh, anyway. Um, can you go back up, Donna, to where you show the site costs? Okay. So my question on the site costs, um, and I did read uh, the basis of design, and then I did my best to try to read the cost estimates. Um, so how much of the field at Fort River is being repaired? Um, so, so that's my sort of, are we, um, it's an enormous field if we go all the way out to the river. So I think, are you doing immediately around the building? Um, to what extent is um, the ball field um, I walked it the other day. There's one pretty near the building where you're showing the contractor would be sitting doing the yeah, work. Kim, can you bring up? Can you bring up? A... So it, it's just a sort of a if, even if you just do it with your little cursor, like because the it's bringing in. Uh, this is my layperson's. We're bringing in dirt to raise the level. <laughs> We're doing some moving of some wetland around and we're raising the level of the foundation. And, and as I understand, the reason the building costs are not that different is because the site cost is picking up the raising of the building. Um, and so just how much of this field uh, will be really usable year round for the kids? I mean, year round, you can't when there's snow and ice on it, but the, the problem with it has been Drain it, drainage, and I know that's one of the things you're trying to do. So, um, and then just let me make a quick comment to respond to Phoebe's uh, how we finance it. That is a separate discussion, but we can begin having that right away with either site to some extent. So similar to what I think of with the Jones Library, they put together a package that paid for the whole thing. You know, so, but but that that's kind of a separate issue um, on how we pay for it, and I just want to get a sense of what we, what we would be we would be buying for that um, eleven million dollars in site work. I, it, you know, whatever that number is on the Fort River site. I understand. I completely understand what we're getting on at Wildwood, but I think the hope is we would get some fields repaired. And that's a good thing. It's not a, a bad thing to have done that. It's right. So I think, yes. Yeah. yeah. So Kathy is, you know, I think that is maybe a, a different way of looking at this. The amenities or the cost of the site, although slightly higher over at Fort River, you're, you're actually gaining fields as opposed to putting and retaining walls and, and such over at Wildwood, right? So um, everything that is in the light green, um, kind of away from the tree lines, all, all of that will be improved. So we're bringing up the soils for the fields. We're putting in the proper drainage to the fields, um, as well as, as doing what we need to do structurally and for the high water table for the building. Can you just move it, Kurt, when you say light green, I'm not seeing lots of different, I, well, I, I know what for. Like, yeah, on. just the green, like sort of the developed area, right? Okay. As opposed to the tree line. Okay. So, okay. so really it's, um, you can see we have pathways and walkways, you know, around the site, around the fields. They'll all be um, ADA accessible, universal access to the fields and the playgrounds, um, et cetera. So, Yes, wherever there's 
construction, um, it will all be upgraded. Okay, that no, that answers my question. I was just trying to get a, a sense of, um, and and I, I think that is the way to frame it. We're getting we're getting something for that money, not just uh, we're get, get getting something very positive. Thanks. Well, you know, I think I think it's important to think of this as being it's fundamentally different the site in the sense that you're making another major municipal improvement as part of the project, but there's a cost associated with that. Yep. Um, and you know, we've certainly heard uh, from a lot of people that these fields are are highly used. So, you know, as I, I say sometimes, unfortunately, it's just money, right? Um, and I'm sure um, the folks on the finance committee, uh, Kathy, which I think includes you, um, would presumably have some concerns about this, especially the fact that it, you know, it has to go to a vote. The community has to support it. So, there are pros and cons. The the one thing I would caution people is that I think it's um, a little bit dangerous to sell this as a. Uh, the focus needs to be as from the MSBA's perspective on the project, not on the value add. So, you know, I think in the in terms of the way we talk about it, and the way we're going to present it to the MSBA, it really needs to be focused on the building, which doesn't mean there isn't a kind of value added proposition here with an associated price tag. Jonathan. Sorry, I, I realized that the, the first half of my last question, I didn't, I don't think really I articulated well enough to get an answer. Um, but that was uh, fundamentally, is the MSBA portion of this likely to be comparable building to building for new construction and new construction and reno and reno? Um, or or is, is there a variance? I, I, don't, I don't remember from our early on discussions about how the, 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 the funding process works. So there is a, there is a small difference. Um, when you reuse a building, you get a small percentage, and I think I calculated it the other day, and it's about 1.8, I think, on this one, uh, additional percentage of reimbursement. Um, but it ends up being a small difference in the overall pot because the reimbursement percentage is only applied to what the the MSBA will reimburse on. And I think you all remember from, you know, the early community forum diagram where I pulled up where the, the cap is relative to construction costs now. So what the MSBA does is they kind of say, our, we take everything off that's our cap, right? And then we only apply the reimbursement to what's left. And then on the ad rano, there's a small additional piece for reusing the building. So um, I don't think it's a a reason to choose the ad reno because the, the difference would be quite small and then uh, so if that if that if that's a helpful answer Jonathan I think it is uh, and, and it would be and safe I, to assume that that within a category uh, if there's any difference at all in the reimbursement it'd be even more minuscule you know the difference be between what we'd get reimbursed for a new school at Wildwood versus a new school at yeah. Port River would be <laughs> no that that you can probably safely say, Jonathan, that um, I, I, not even safely, you, you will exceed MSBA's cap on the building cost. Right now it's 360 a square foot, right? So that's all you're gonna get reimbursed on both sites. And the same thing for site, it's 8% of the building costs. So when, when you're comparing the two, MSBA's reimbursement would be the same. There's, there's no question about that. So and what I'm really getting at is it's not going to help us decide between the sites. <laughs> yeah, they're not I, I giving wish I any could more say money. That. <laughs> <laughs> no. They're not they're not participating in anything over their caps, which you're going to exceed on both. So that's another way of looking at it, right? It's um, the town will bear the additional cost at either site, yeah. which this, means Fort yeah. River would be slightly higher. It made more it made a significant difference when there wasn't such a big difference between the cap, the, the cap and the cost. Um, you know, it, it actually it was it was significant. But once you have to say, well, we're not reimbursing on 
it's almost two thirds of the project, right? Then what your, your applicable reimbursement impact for ad reno becomes quite small. Sean. So one of my reservations with the Fort Riverside has always been the, you know, the moisture issue. And, and we've heard different um, technical experts say that there's ways to manage it or, or mitigate it. But I guess I just, I wanna put you on the spot a little bit and just say, if, if we were to invest these funds in the Fort River site, will the improvements made here ensure that we have no moisture issues either at the building or on the fields 15 years from now? Because I think that's what we're all thinking is 15 years down the road, is there any potential there will be moisture issues because of specific to this site? Um, or will these improvements completely address those so that we don't have to worry about that? Rick or Rick or Tim, I, I, I know it's a hard question, but no, no, it's, no, it's, it's, it's the right, it's, the it's right a question. fair question, right? So uh, we're, we're doing everything. I don't know if Rick wants to chime in, but um, you know we're doing everything that today's technologies provide, um, and it's the prudent thing we have. We we vetted it both, you know, with all of our engineers and consultants to ensure that this will, you know, last the test of time or, or stand the test of time. I, 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 you know, Rick, I don't know if you want uh, to chime in. There, Is there... I, you know, if you had a building type or a design that depended on a basement, certainly having, you know, groundwater three to four feet below your first floor area would uh, you know cause one to do more and more to assure that you don't have a problem, but with a slab by grade project like this, with bringing the building up a couple of feet, uh, this would be uh, a, a forever uh, situation. Uh, I would not anticipate future problems from moisture from the ground. Does, can, can I just chime in on, Sean is asking for assurances. Are there insurances that say, um, we're telling you this will work and we'll fix it if it doesn't. I'm just, you know, because um, we are, it's your, <laughs> Jonathan is laughing, but I know Jonathan, you were on the Fort River project. So we also had this kind of assurance that this could be coped with, right? I mean, with, um, so I, and Margaret has said it's only money, Kathy, um, in terms of doing it and pointed out that Boston is built on a swamp. But so I, I just don't know to what extent um, there is that Sean asked 15 years. I'd like to know 50 years, you know, that we that we really we're we're not going to encounter what we have encountered in the past. And yeah, I, I mean, I think to answer your question, Kathy, and we're, we're not trying to evade it, I, you know, there aren't, we don't have an insurance policy that would say that we would, you know, um, be able to address this 15, 20 years down the road. Um, I don't know what kind of insurance, flood insurance policies there may be for the town to be able to do that, but you know, the design of this is solid, so this shouldn't be an issue. Um, to, to answer, you know, we have continuously reached out trying to find other buildings that have been built for over 10 years that have similar um, kind of characteristics, and we haven't been able to get that answer for you yet, and, and, and we've been pushed. Paul. It, this is a really important discussion. Could you? I would like to phrase it in a different way. If we said to you, we do not want water damage, and that's the concern because we are living in a water damaged area right now. If we do not want water damage for 50 years for, forward, what would you design to say we can almost guarantee um, 
what it is. So would you do would you design something differently to say if we if your mission was to we do not want water intrusion or the impacts of water on this building, would you do something different? I see Rick's unmuted. I don't know if he's going to respond. The answer is no. We we wouldn't. We would. No. This is the best approach yep. to addressing the water. I mean, I can answer just in a few ways. I mean, there are a certain number of ways that water can get into the building. It can be there, which is why we're raising it out of the floor. So it's literally above the water or it can soak through the soil, which is why we're adding the sub drainage and the porous layer. And we are also adding a vapor or water barrier under the slab. So all of the ways that water can get into a building from below, from the soil, which is the issue, we are dealing with them specifically and moving the building out of um, the threat for moisture to get in. So, um, you know, the ways that are available to us with the technology that is there today, we are addressing it from every direction. So there's no other um, technology that you would say, well, if you really want to go first class and make sure you would also do, you would raise it three feet or something else like that. Or put it on, I'm not sure what the technology is. <laughs> yeah, Houston has them on stilts just outside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly if you put it on stilts for flooding, you don't have a groundwater moisture problem. Uh, <laughs> but there's nothing you're leaving off the there's there's nothing the that tools leaving, that you're leaving there's out nothing that we're leaving off for having groundwater which frankly is everywhere yeah. uh it's just the proximity of groundwater to the underside of the building is is actually a little higher in one location than the other and it's a little different at fort river than it is at at wildwood wildwood we talk about perched water tables that flow across uh varying soil conditions but it, you're still trying to stop water from getting under the building so uh i can appreciate that the town has a heightened sensitivity given uh what they've been living through but with a building with new ventilation to keep moving moisture out with vapor barriers that have improved markedly from what you would build at any site now to those existing buildings that didn't have one. Uh, virtually everything that you could do, we, we're, we're doing subsurface drainage, capillary breaks, raising it up, diverting water away, and being able to uh, drain it off by gravity and not depending on pumps. Yeah, Paul, I, I just want to chime in and, and concur. I think um, Danisco and their team with all the engineers have definitely made this building a, a dry building. I, I think that sort of taking it up a level that, you know, the fundamental difference in some ways in the question you're asking is that one of these sites is near a river and one of them is not. And so it's, it's a climate change issue in a way. I mean, I think that the, the site has been well described in terms of the, the flood hazards and the flood concerns. But the, the issue, if there was one in the future, is probably not a 50 year issue, but it is, it is a question, you know, just about um, flooding as it relates to climate change and whether that will increase over time. And I know everybody's super sensitive to it, but I would definitely say that Danisco's done all the right things here from an engineering perspective. Uh, the question I have is not about water intrusion. So if people have more about that, feel free to keep going. <laughs> no, I, no. I, I think that, that for okay. me, that did it, thank you. So I'm wondering where, um, if, if you guys can pinpoint in the numbers that we went through, where is the longer construction time at Wildwood indicated? Like where in those numbers? 
So Phoebe, it's in the detail and it's, yeah. it is reflected in the general conditions. So you remember a couple of weeks ago, I emailed about the general conditions. Yep. Um, if you, if you dig into the, to the detail of the invoices of the estimates, you will see that there is a different number of months and the two estimators took a different slightly different approach, but came up with roughly the same number about this. So there's a monthly cost for having the contractor on the site. So what happens if you if you look at that general conditions number, which is not broken out here, um, the, um, well, it's in the contractor markup line, I shouldn't say that, you're gonna get a, a higher number for that on the ad reno versions than you are on, the new construction versions, but there's a lot of other stuff in there. So I would say, what are we looking at? 20, call it 26 million for contractor markups on Fort River and 24 and a half on Wildwood. If you look at the those numbers on the new the new ones, they're all lower. That's that is that item reflected. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, can I, I have one more thing? I, I also think that um, in terms of looking at the the flood stuff, so maybe I do have something to say about the <laughs> about the water intrusion. Um, they, I, from what I'm understanding from hearing from uh, all of the people that are looking at this and talking about this in town right now, is that the the floodplain numbers that everybody looks at are like hundred years and longer. So I mean. Am I correct in thinking about that's the span of time we're talking about when we're talking about um, you know nature and and water and that kind of stuff? We're not talking about the immediate future. We're doing everything we can to resolve what we can for the immediate future. But if we're talking about numbers, we're talking about well over fifty years. Correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well. I, yeah, I just want to jump in. I I don't think that. My understanding is that when it says 100 year, it means it could happen next year. It doesn't mean it won't happen for 100 years. It means, right. you know, and we've had 300 year, I mean, I'm not there, but we've had every, it seems like every other year, someone says this is a 100 year event for us. Um, so I think that I don't know much about climate change, but it seems like it's moving quicker. And it's so it, it's not like it won't happen for 100 years, but it could happen next year. That's the likelihood of something happening is what they say. Yeah, there, there's a, it's, it's in those FEMA details, but it's a percent Phoebe, you know, and so that, that's the, um, the chances of it happening. Uh, um, and FEMA's maps have gotten much better, you know, on topographical, but uh, I think um, a couple of people sent me pictures of a New Jersey school that was washed out and I, I don't think they had expected it to be. I mean, this was just, it was one of those wasn't supposed to happen. Um, so I just live in New Jersey. That would be the only reason I would know something about that. So I, um, I think I got one question that was emailed to me last night on um, the two cost estimators sitting down and comparing. It, it, I believe that happened. There was a reconciliation between the two. Could you, yep. could you just describe that a little bit? Because I've never been. Sure. Yeah. What exactly? What, ha <laughs> what happened when they did? What happened when they did that? <laughs> right. So you know, as as Donna said in the introduction, and I said in my memo, um, it it is a requirement. It's a really good best practice for projects like this because. Um, the two estimators do their estimates in parallel. Um, the estimator who is working for the designer is typically cons considered the estimator of record. Um, and then there's a reconciliation, which we did on Tuesday. It took about four hours. We went through line by line um, and they made adjustments based on you know, there were some, we caught some errors. The, the goal is to really kind of test the estimate of record and provide two sets of eyes. So uh, that was the process. And then when the PSR goes in, I'll actually um, provide, uh, one of my jobs is to provide a comparison of the two, but they came in, you know, very close at this level, um, amazingly close. 
um, considering, you know, again, that there's not, there's very little drawn, uh, a lot conceptualized, but very little drawn, so. Thank you. Are there any other questions on either, I mean, we're, be, we're looking at the high level of aggregation of pages and pages of cost estimates that we received. You know, one thing that I observed in trying to figure out where the higher costs were, I know prices are up, but I believe last time in, in the preliminary and we got criticized for this, we had the um, ground source wells and the PV as below the, below the line. And I don't think you added the 25% on top of that, so um, so that alone would add about one and a half million dollars to the, the number now. They're above the line, and then when you do that, one twenty-five. Um, am I right about that? I mean, so that's not necessarily a price increase. It's calculated in a different way to get to the total. I think the markups when they did it, the markups were on those line items, so pulling them up into the total just sort of puts them above the line and below the line. Yeah. yeah just, but we did talk about possibly just subcontracting those out directly so that we didn't have to pay the, the markup on them, right? As a, as a potential option, not a definite, yes. but. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, was, I think this was just an observation. Yeah, that, yep. that's... yeah. I think, I think the PVs are probably um, overstated by the time you put the markups in. Um, the cost estimates, that we had gotten from solar design were, um, I, I believe, intended to be all in numbers, right? Um, the ground source is a little more complicated, especially depending on which site, um, but, and which option, but, you know, that too, if it goes hard bid versus CM, we should talk about as well. There, there can there can be a false economy there too by splitting things up yeah. and having nobody responsible for the uh, operation of an entire system. You know, the lines drawn on PV are pretty clear. The integration of ground source with, with uh, building HVAC operation starts to get murkier. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I think the goal here was to make as close to an apples to apples comparison as possible. And the decision, you know, as I said earlier about how we're gonna contract this, how we're gonna procure it is a decision for the next phase. And there are savings in some of these items on some of these potentially depending on how that is managed. Yeah, and you know, I wasn't suggesting that we should split it up. I was just thinking that that one difference in the way we got these two numbers was that roll up, because um, I think we had also been asked um, but with some public comments, what you just said, Rick, that it was it wise to break things out. You really want someone responsible for the whole project. So um, exactly. we wouldn't want to jeopardize the project in any way. I mean, once we're at $98 million, it's uh, or 100, whatever the number is, um, you, you want to keep the risk as low as possible. Phoebe. So um, I'm, I'm trying to furiously make my notes and I've been thinking a lot about the matrix as well. Um, and uh, what I keep coming back to in terms of what I'm seeing as our major differences are like, you know, a, a roughly $2 million cost difference between the site, 22 months of construction at Fort River versus like 26 at, at Wildwood. Um, and then the site work, which at Fort River includes, it looks like a larger play structure, the fields, all of that. Am I missing large pieces? Um, because it, it seems like a lot of the other stuff is, is more apples to apples. We're getting it on one site, we're getting it on the other site. Um, are there other large categories um, as we, you know, we're gonna transition to the matrix piece of this for Monday, but I wanna make sure that I'm looking at this the right way. Yeah, I, I, you're, um, that, that's a, those are accurate statements, Phoebe. I think the only caveat I would say is that the play structures, et cetera, and the play areas would be equal on both sides. So, so the difference is the kind of play fields 
is right. is slightly different. Um, the only other thing, which really, when you're talking 80, 90 million dollars, really is a drop in the hat, but the hazmat over at Wildwood actually um, the hazardous material abatement for the demolition of the existing schools slightly higher as as identified here. But other than that, um, yeah, you're you're correct. Paul and yes. Tammy. Yep. Yeah, yeah, from my perspective, I'll be looking those the numbers for the traffic improvements um, and what what they buy you are things that I'll be looking at. They looked a little bit weak to me. The numbers seem low from seeing what we're doing, winding up with construction costs in our um, construction works. But I would want to review the, those numbers with the uh, town engineer and what we're and what we're getting for both of them. They, they seem to be equivalent, and I'm, I'm wondering about that. So, Paul, the one the one item at the Fort River intersection, um, Main and um, East Street, is we we are not that does not include reconfiguration of that that intersection. That is so so that is a difference. Um, we would love to improve that area more, but that became more complicated given what land would require reconfiguration, et cetera. So we didn't really want to go down that road. Tammy, and then Rupert. Um, just to piggyback a little bit on what Phoebe said, but to also consider the differences during the construction phase and how it might affect learning um, it seemed to me, and, and please, uh, I would love more clarification, is that if we were to build at the Wildwood site, there would be far more congestion as it relates to um, impacting student learning uh, traffic than it would at the Fort River site. Is that correct? Y yes, yes, you are correct. It's a much smaller site and less area for the contractor and lay down. Uh, the proximity to the existing building is probably similar, but there's more area for separation, for parking, for play, for right over at Wild. It just by the nature of the size of the site. Rupert. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to go back to the um, traffic improvements. I was curious on the Wildwood site, sorry, the Wildwood side, it says signalization improvement. And I'm wondering if that's still at that uh, Main Street, Southeast Street, Northeast Street intersection, or is that signalization improvement for Wildwood someplace else? The signalization is at East Pleasant. It would be adding a signalization, correct, Tim? That is correct. Yeah. That's adding a signalization at that and strong and is pleasant. That's great. I, I uh, that, that's the answer I was wanting to hear. Thank you. And can I just jump in there? And then what is the signalization improvements for Fort River? That's re replacing the existing equipment um, so that you can have better signalization, maybe on a timed. Yeah. Right. Right now, um, I was out there the other day. There's no left hand turn, and it's not a time timed. So it would pull it. As, as you know, as North Amherst talking about a smarter, smarter light. It's not a very smart light right now. Um, yeah, from from what we heard from Par is just that it's um, old technology. Yeah, it doesn't allow you to do some of the fancier things. So, um, I you know, see Rupert's hand up still. Rupert. Okay. Rupert. So, one of the just one um, checking on a detail that I saw in the estimates, um, and I think we expected this that if it's a two story building versus a three story building, the photo costs go down. Is that because we can be doing more roof canopies? And, and they're less putting it on the roof as opposed to putting it on a parking lot. Is that the reason for the difference on the on the photovoltaic costs? That is correct. The PV on the roof has a lower unit cost than 
the well, the, the panels themselves are the same, but all of the structure to support them in the parking lot at an expense to the canopy mounted PV. Okay, thank you. And just can I, while I'm on PV, um, one of our criteria is maximizing energy efficiency. Is there likely to be much of a difference between a new two-story and a new three-story? I'm sorry, Kathy, maximizing. Energy efficient, energy. Everything, we, everything we saw modeled with the ground mm -hmm. source and with the PV in terms of building envelope, but kilowatt hours, what we needed. It, or is there a difference? Um, I'm not saying there's sure there's a little difference, but is there a 10% difference, a 5% difference? Is there a much of a difference that we should know? It's less than 5%. It's probably less than 1%. Um, uh, the other factors, uh, the choice of heating system, air source versus ground source are much larger contributors. Uh, the difference in ratio of conditioned air to um, the envelope where the heat loss occurs is 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 there, but it's small and it's it's smaller than the difference between a new building and a renovation in addition. Okay, thank you. Phoebe. Um, so we have an estimate that the town has estimates for roundabout elsewhere, correct? Pomeroy. What does that look like? Is it close to that 350 number? It's not close to that. Kathy, you're shaking your head. It's 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 quite a bit. Paul, Paul's going to shake his head too. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's, it's a different project, obviously. Oh, right. um, and so this, you're talking about a driveway roundabout versus a state highway roundabout. So I think that that's, you know, but we, we know something about that construction project. And so that, that's why I did want to talk with our 10 engineers to vet those numbers a little bit deeper. You know, okay. I think to me, one of the closest we've got, and maybe UMass can give us, is in, down on University Drive where there's that small roundabout. So it's not four streets coming together. It's one coming in and then it slows you down. You go around a curve. It's a really small one um, when you buy, buy the dorms when you go south. Anyway, it's, it's not a big fancy roundabout. It's a little tiny roundabout <laughs> um, that doesn't have cross traffic. Um, so... And is, I'm sorry, is there, is there any, sorry, I have lots of stuff going on today. <laughs> um, is there any, uh, anything else that needs to be taken into account with that, given that it's near that little pond area and the cemetery? And I think, I think as, as it relates to the, you know, preliminary drawing, um, I think, I think we're fine. Uh, we would obviously need to study that further to make sure, but we did it in a manner that we were respectful of that intersection in the pond. John? Yeah, I, mean, I think this, the, those additional site costs are helpful, but for me, I don't think it should really impact our decision. I, I'm not sure the the rationale um, for what we're doing at each site um, is necessarily, I don't know, consistent or, or, you know, what we would propose if we were to kind of sit back and think about it. Um, I got, you know, I voiced my concerns about, do we really need a roundabout at the entrance of Wildwood? Um, or would it be better to make improvements elsewhere down, down the line where the traffic looked worse? Um, and why would we do a roundabout at Wildwood's entrance, but not do it at either of those busy Fort River intersections if, if we were going to try to really impact the traffic, um, the, the, the areas where the traffic scores were really poor. So um, for me, I, I'm going to probably ignore those offsite costs because I think we need a lot more thought about what we would do and get, um, as Paul said, talk with our town engineers about estimates and things like that. Oh, I see Jonathan's hands up and Mike's hand is up. And I know Mike, you're going to have to leave early too. So Jonathan. Uh, oops, I'll be quick. Uh, I it just, it's been, I, I've been reminded that, that once upon a time, both schools uh, had larger populations too. So um, once upon a time, uh, something like 600 uh, kids attended both those schools. So um, those intersections in the past did deal with, with higher levels of, of, of traffic and, uh, and for me, that kind of equalizes things, I think. 
Mike. Thank you. Uh, and, and I'm sorry that I do have a graduation. One of our schools is graduating in half an hour, so I'll be here for about 15 more minutes. So uh, this may be jumping the gun a bit, but um, I think I'll, I'll be gone when some of these conversations are happening. So just uh, first thing is just want to thank the Danisco folks. It's an incredible amount of detail that you provided us and, and Margaret. And so that's really helpful. And I appreciate all the work you're doing because this isn't easy stuff. Uh, and that's why there's so many questions from our committee. So thanks to the committee for doing that. You know, I, I, I want to follow up on Sean's comment, which I, uh, I agree with. I think, um, you know, I do anticipate that there's going to be on costs we're not calculating right now uh, for traffic improvements. Um, and, and I agree with Sean, I'm not, I'm not worried about it because it, it's just going to be part of the equation, you know, likely at both sites and hard to predict, um, but I just want the public to know that this, when, when they see these estimates, I'm not, an, I'm not a cost estimate, I'm not an architect, but uh, my guiding assumption is that there, there may be some costs to you know, influence traffic patterns that we're not calculating here. And I think I expressed in my prior meet, at the last meeting, uh, to the concerns about traffic. Um, I still have those concerns. I agree with what Jonathan said. I was there when it was 500 some odd, pretty similar population. Um, so. So I get that, and uh, I think there's opportunities there. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the determining factor in, in how I'm thinking about it right now, but I also want to, I'd rather brace people for potential bad news down the road than uh, people feel like the numbers that we're seeing today are the end-all, be-all, absolute numbers, right? That's a long way away when we're getting to project scope and budget, right? So when people see numbers, sometimes they're like, oh, why are they different? They're going to continue to change for a while. Um, I'm glad they're getting, I agree with Phoebe, I'm glad they're getting probably uh, closer, finer tuned, but that, that tuning process is a long, long process with many, many decisions to make that will influence it. And my uninformed, or not uninformed, uh, unexpert opinion, lack of expert opinion is that I think there will need to be some improvements at the, the Fort River track patterns, uh, perhaps even more so at the other site. And I'm really concerned, I would say, you know, in terms of the, what Sean raised earlier about the, what what wild would look like during construction. You know, that's a hard problem to solve. So I'm all, I'm not negative today. I'm going to give a lovely, lovely talk in half an hour. Uh, but, you know, I think all this detail is incredibly helpful for me and my deliberation and just appreciate the dialogue and, and everyone's willingness to hang in there with, you know, uh, some complex information being shared with us. Paul. And I'm going to disagree a little bit because I do the traffic piece does I, I said that already that's it's about money from my hat on as town manager it's about money and the, the traffic impact the cost of the traffic changes that have to happen because that's going to ultimately fall on the town's dime probably. And so I think that that's something that we want to pay attention to I would I want to make it pay attention to um, because. Uh, I don't really weigh in on the educational values of the different things. I trust our educators to do that. Um, but, you know, I think the traffic impacts are, are important to take into consideration. Okay, I'll just call on myself to make, and maybe we can do a transition to the matrix. Um, but um, I did attend a uh, program and Chris Brestrup was there also where the state was profiling new grant programs they have available to towns. And one of them was called congested intersections near schools. Um, it actually had a nice ring to it. And I asked uh, during the Q&A whether it could be when a, where a cool driveway is coming out and running into cars. And she said, absolutely, that's what that kind of that's what we're talking about with it. So I think, um, you know, I'm not going to oversell your your staff's grant getting ability, Paul, but you keep exceeding expectations. So <laughs> so so I, I think um, and I, I had someone from TAC, which is the Transportation Advisory Committee, email me to say, don't forget that there are these this program has been set up for this. So I think that we need to have that in the back of our head for either school, um, you know, grabbing that money. So I'm just wondering if, if people um, are comfortable moving, we've got some invoices. I wanna make time for public comments. 
Mike said he has to leave. So there were a couple of things on the matrix and then talking about um, how we're planning on using it. We're meeting again on Monday morning. Um, so it is, is transitioning to that next one okay with people? Yes, okay. So I, I think there were a couple of things we were, um, and we had a quick discussion while we were waiting for everyone to join this morning before we went on recording. But I was asking how um, in the Danisco experience as we start to work with the matrix and hopefully everyone will, to the extent they can score it before they come to next Monday, you know, just uh, Phoebe, as I think I started to do the same thing. There were only a few things that varied a lot. And I was deciding, you know, this is a, a plus, this is a minus, however you want to do it. So I was asking how do committees fill out that matrix? And um, one thing is to come to a meeting prepared to talk about it. And then uh, Donna said, sometimes, you know, at the end of that, everyone just sends in their scoring and the NESCO averages of them, you know, so if everyone said plus or minus, but I wanted to, um, to be able to even be thinking about this, we've got either three level score or four level score. And I thought it might be useful to resolve where, where, whether we're going with four, or we're going with three. And I don't know whether had people formed an opinion about that. Margaret argued for three would be easier to work with and clearer. Um, you know, and this is relative. So that everything about is, is this option better than another option that we're looking at? Not better than what we have now? And or are there basically no differences? So she argued three would be better, but we've got on the table of four level scoring or three level scoring. So I don't know whether people tried to use it and came to any conclusions. So I will just open it up for that because I thought it would be helpful if we at least were all using one, two, three or one, two, three, four as a way we're thinking about it. So does anyone want to chime in on their thoughts if they started to try to work with this? Mike. Mike's hand went up and then down. Uh, I'm just not a Zoom person, sorry. Use a different system, it's easier for me. Um, so um, I have a bias towards four point ratings because I think when I'm offered a neutral rating, I tend to gravitate towards it, but I am not wed to that. If the committee says three makes sense, five makes sense, whatever it is, I'm, I'm fine with that, just in my own research and background and, and you know, doctoral research, you know, it's kind of four or five. And um, I, I like to add up more when there's forced choices, even if it's the same ratings, it doesn't have the, you know, people love neutral scores, right? It's just like, you know, not being negative, not being positive, it's just okay. And, and I like not having that option for myself and others. And if it's three, you'll never hear me complain again about it. I'm totally roll, roll with the group. Phoebe. I think I was the, I think when you and I met Kathy, I was the one who said, you know, let's do three. <laughs> so I'm kind of shooting myself in the foot here, but <laughs> um, I, I, because of this, I tend to agree with you, Mike. Um, I think that in this case, I think four might be good. I think that there is something, maybe it's a similar category somewhere in there. So not a completely neutral, um, because I don't know that anything in this situation is truly neutral, but I think, you know, if one of those four could be like, you know, similar, um, not as good, best, you know, I, I don't really know how to work that. Um, but so that we can have indicators of where things are, um, quite similar, but maybe something, you know, there's, there's one way to skew it or another that each of us feels individually. So I, I would say four as well. And I don't know what those four categories are necessarily, but. Any other thoughts? I, I think changing the word to similar is extremely helpful, you know, you know, cause, cause this is, this is not so much, um, it, this is, where we have no variation be across the four options is what I would call a similar. So it can't be better and it can't be worse. It, we, might, we, we might think they're all equally bad, you know, is it another way of, of doing it. You know, so you could still rank them. Um, but so does anyone, you know, it's sounding like we're still staying with four. And, and what I noticed in trying to use four, if the bottom, the worst, 
means totally unacceptable. I don't think we have any that are totally unacceptable. So I was finding myself not having that as a category. Um, yeah. it, so that was my issue with the four. When we started with four, we still had the 165 person school um, that didn't fit anything we wanted to do. So it was totally unacceptable and it's dropped, dropped off the um, edge of the platform. Well, I'm not, I'm not seeing any strong opinion. So, um, you know, if people can work with the matrix, um, there were a few suggested deletes last time when we met on the 20th. We said um, a couple of things just aren't varying at all or we have no information on them. Um, so one, we'd already deleted this contextually sensitive design. Um, Jonathan, you had flagged several others. It wasn't clear that um, the, uh, the redistricting, we don't have any information on redistricting, but it's gonna be the same, whichever do, we're consolidating a school. Um, so deleting a few, or people could just leave them blank for now on that, that there's either no information, but getting to a smaller number will probably be helpful for us. But that was, there were several that were flagged. Um, last time. And I'm totally willing to be um, the controller of the matrix if you want me to be and just go ahead and delete a few of them and come with a recommendation on what to delete at the beginning of the next meeting, you know, send it into everyone as recommended deletes, if that's the most useful way of doing it. And um, just so we get to, I want to try to get to a matrix that we can use on Monday and we can start to fill it out row by row. And then the other thought about Monday is if among these options, and I'll pick ad reno for the time being, when we talked about it on, on May 20th, there were very few people arguing in favor of that option. So if we are at the point of narrowing options, having one less variation to think about because we're kind of in agreement, it doesn't meet some key categories that we want, including open the school in 2026, um, we, we could make that decision Monday, and then the following Monday is when we have to get to preferred. So I put on the agenda is potentially narrowing our options. And I was thinking in terms of ad reno and, and doing a little bit of thinking of two-story versus three-story, but not making a site decision on Monday. Does that sound okay with everyone as, as a way of proceeding on Monday? And the entire Monday discussion is about the matrix and about our options. We're not gonna have any presentations. It's gonna be us talking to each other. Margaret, I see your hand is up. Yeah, I just wanna make one suggestion. If we're gonna stick with the four, the version, I'll pull up the matrix and show you my thought about this. So can everybody see this? Yep. So I think if you're going to keep the four, which is this line, right, I would change advantageous to a light green in the same way that not advantageous is a light, uh, I think this was intended to be a light red, because I think the yellow as a color in terms of making public presentations is confusing. It kind of looks like a highlight. So that would be my one thought about the, the keeping the four. You know, the other way, if it's hard for people to work with colors, you could make it one, two, three, four, and just put a number in it, you know, just for, you know, mm -hmm. one, one is the worst and four is the best or something. You know, I think any way people come in. Um, so I agree, Margaret, we, we don't want to pick a color that's the, the super happy color shouldn't be in between the other. Yeah, colors. <laughs> yeah, it should be. It's mildly OK or mildly not OK. And then there are the extremes. And I think, as Phoebe said, there's a lot of nuance here. So I think that there's likely to be more in the middle and less on the extremes. Rupert. Well, I think you guys have already said what I was uh, thinking about, which is making the, uh, the harsh, uh, unacceptable uh, a shade of less favorable that's stronger than, than the one before. That's okay. it. So the good news is we can change our color scheme right up to the very end. Um, you know, uh, when I used to do chart presentations, I also tried to make sure whether it showed up in grayscale because sometimes all the num all the colors mush, which makes it really hard when you print it out on a black and white printer. <laughs> For me, it's not the color, it's, 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 the, it's the verbal description that's important. Right. Yep. 
Okay, so, you know, one of the um, issues, when Donna presented it to the school committee, the other thing that every everything includes the educational space identified the program. So we no longer have that as a row that's varying, you know, that we just moved it up to that the same way they all are going to meet net zero, they're all going to be ADA accessible, they're all going to be safe entrances. So we're not trying to score those um, at all. Um, so that that's one that got removed. So Margaret, you can send this around and we can just mm -hmm. do a, a note on some of the things that were, yep. I'll call them potential deletes right now because they were flagged by at least three or four people as a, um, not a useful criteria and yep. we can always delete more. Great. So any, uh, um, Rupert, is your hand back up? No. Great. Um, I'm thinking that if there's any more comments on this tool, hopeful people will be using it for next week. We have invoices that we need to be voting on. Um, and I wanna make sure everyone is here and then I wanna turn to public comments. Um, so I think we have several invoices, is that correct? Yes, and um, actually I apologize because I thought I had sent them last night, but I didn't. Um, but they're in your inbox and I am going to pull them up. I just first want to show a summary of what they look like, just so you all have some context. So this is where we are. So this screen, um, this is the Denisco invoices. This is the answer invoices. So because we skipped over doing this last month, there's two months invoices for each firm. So here are Denisco's two invoices, which include what they have been charging on a monthly basis for this phase. And then they have, a, there's a little bit of money for the wrap up on the first phase of the traffic study. So their total build for the two invoices is $135 uh, and $4. And then for us, same thing, two invoices, a little bit of time for Shelly Potorf, who I think you will remember as our net zero guru. And so that total is 28,560. So I'm just gonna quickly um, scroll through the invoices. Um, so first I'm going to do, um, let's see here. First I'm gonna do the, Here we go. So this is the Denisco invoices. There's quite a few pages here. Um, the, uh, so this is the first invoice, it has a number of cover pages. And then um, and I haven't signed these yet, but I will. This is the, the actual invoice. Um, they are also providing uh, workforce participation on a monthly basis. And then this is the second one, I believe. So same deal. Here's their invoice. And this is the this is the invoice for repairs. Wrap up on the first there'll be be more work on the traffic study. So this is just the wrap up on the first phase, which was approved. And then again, there's their summary. So that's their invoice. <coughs> And then our invoices are shorter. I, I can just get it to open. Okay, got it. Okay, so here are our invoices. Ours, as you'll remember, are a little bit different in that we show our time, um, our time is billed on an hourly basis. So there's this detail of what everybody's doing. It goes on and on here. Shelly chiming in. Uh, this Shelly's invoice attachment. And then I thought I had added the second invoice. One second. And here's the second invoice, the 10,090. So it 
kind of looks the same. And these are, again, these are in your email if you want to take a look in more detail. So there you go. Any comments, questions? I see Sean's hand is up or Sean's hand went up and down. Yeah, so I'll, I'll two things. First, um, Margaret, I, I do have a different build previously number for answer than what you had on the screen. It doesn't affect these invoices, so I'm going to make the motion to approve these invoices, but you and I should connect after and just reconcile yeah. our, our invoices together. Let's um, do it, because I didn't, I didn't do this for the previous one, so we should check it. Okay, um, but I will move to approve these invoices. Second. Is there any discussion? No, nope. then I will put it to a vote. Uh, Jonathan. Yes. Rupert. Yes. Mike. Yes. Paul. Yes. Allison. Yes. Tammy. Angelica. Yes. Phoebe. Yes. Simone. Yes. Ben. Yes. Alicia. Yes. And Kathy said yes, it's unanimous. Okay, so thank you everyone. Um, I just, I'm going to open, unless I hear other comments, I'll open it for public comments, but I just wanna make sure everyone's calendar has, that we're meeting a few days from now on Monday morning at 8.30 for a discussion with potential narrowing, um, but really using the matrix. Then we're meeting the following Monday because um, we had to move that date to come to a preferred option. And then we're meeting on the 24th of June, which is a Friday. And Angelica told me that at least one of these was listed as a 7.30 in the morning. And I didn't mean to do that. So these are all, the morning meetings are all starting at, at 8.30. And I'll double check that. And the, that at that at those different time periods, Danisco will be preparing the document that's this uh, PSR that goes to MSBA, and they can't prepare a big chunk of it until we make the preferred option because that will be the rationale for why we made that selection. So I want to assure both everyone here, but any Buddy in the public, we've been getting a lot of terrific public comments, um, thinking through some of this. So we've got some background rationales, both for what we've talked about and some written ones. Um, and I will say that as the emails have poured in, one of the things I've picked up is several people have said, whatever you pick, I'm for it, which, which is a really nice endorsement of our kids need a new school. Um, and that's why we're all here. So I really liked it when people were saying that. So I, I see a, a couple of hands up. Rupert's hand is up and Donna's hand is up. So before I open it up. Uh, Kathy, did you want me to share a few of my thoughts? Because um, I wasn't at the last meeting where folks were talking about things or would you like me to put that off? Um, I, I think if you could, you know, Rupert missed the last meeting and then uh, watched it and he had a couple of thoughts. If you could do it really quickly and then I will open it up, Rupert, that would be great. Cool. So. Um, uh, I had particular thoughts uh, about uh, how to think about the future use of, of what site is not selected. Uh, there was some discussion about that and I recognize it's not really this committee's uh, decision, but there's some information that I think is worth sharing. Um, as you noticed in the, um, in the, the price summary, the um, abatement issues uh, for hazardous materials at Wildwood is, is higher. Um, uh, there, it, there's more hazardous material there, and I believe that that will impact uh, whoever tries to use that building next if it's not taken down. Um, it interferes greatly with operations uh, and, uh, and management of the school as it is now. It's just a tremendous hassle. I think it was something like a, a $400,000 difference in the, uh, in the um, Pricing, I suspect that it might be a little higher if it were for a building that was going to be reoccupied instead of uh, one that was being demolished. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing, uh, some folks were uh, concerned about uh, loss of the uh, playing area at Fort River. 
Um, and I just wanted to point out that uh, right now, uh, school staff are not maintaining the fields. Uh, that's being done by uh, the Department of Public Works. I certainly don't wanna um, commit them to doing anything in the future. Uh, they have enough in their plate as it is, but I just wanted to point out that the, the field maintenance and the outside bathroom maintenance is, is done by DPW and not by the schools department. Um, so that was one area that I wanted to comment on. The other area is that um, uh, I think uh, in terms of transportation issues, it will help us if we can divide, we, if we can clarify what we're talking about. I think that it, to separate out getting onto and off of the site is one issue comparing the sites. Uh, then the pick up and drop off is a separate issue. And then pedestrian friendliness is a third. Um, and um, I just wanted to uh, say that I think um, the issues uh, at the Port River, getting out of Port River in particular, um, are quite problematic in terms of transportation and uh, bus safety. Uh, and if we had all the students there, um, if there were uh, the same number of buses we have right now, it might be one or two less, but if the same number of buses we have right now, uh, the vast majority of them will be trying to turn out, turn right out of the exit of Fort River uh, and then negotiate that problematic intersection. So um, I think that that's a, a potential strong negative in terms of transportation safety. I have other thoughts, but I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Rupert. I think that was very helpful. Donna, I see your hand is up and Margaret's hand is up. So, yeah, my, my only comment, Kathy, um, just goes back to all the meetings. I just want everyone to hope maybe attend. We have a community forum on the nine. Oh, I forgot. I wow. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I just, I just wanted to let everyone know um, we'll, we'll be doing a similar presentation to the community just to, for, for one last um opportunity to hear folks and their opinions be, before final vote. And I distributed the, the flyer is available. Um, I, I just, I, I, I'm not sure we sent it to the committee. We should send it to the committee uh, to, um, it's- oh, Yeah, being, I'll send that out this morning. It's being, it, I sent it to all the, the town council. We are gonna be posting it, but it would be terrific to get a, a good turnout there for Q and A um, for discussion because it is just before we we take our vote, um, so it's on the ninth, and it is on the website, so you can also point people to the website. Okay. Okay, I don't see any other hands up, so I am going to open it for public comment. We are open, um, and uh, Sean can help me figure out how to bring people in. I see one hand is up, two hands are up, three hands are up, four hands are up. Chris is, Chris Reddell's coming in. Okay, thank you. Hi, Chris, you have joined us. Chris, if you, I, I, you're here and it looks like you're unmuted, so. That, is that better? Are you hearing yeah, me? We can. Okay, um, let's see. Um, first, uh, thank you very much for your very thorough and work both on the part of the committee and on the part of Denisco. This is, it looks like a, this is a good model for a, a good, uh, uh, committee process. Um, I'm generally I had in my at the last meeting a, a series of comments having to do with the basis of design, basically on the specifications for the building. Um, uh, Kathy, you said, but can you hold off on that until later? That stuff will come up later. Yes and no. Um, it, it once a, the dollar sign figure is established, it certain has a certain viability in and of itself. It's very hard later on to upgrade the um, this a number once it's gone public. Um, so I don't really agree that we haven't had any questions about the basis of design. They haven't, uh, that is to say, about the specifications on the building. And some of them are important. And there's a phenomenon, which is that you have one, um, one opportunity to uh, build the envelope of your building, basically. 
uh, once it's done, it's done, and we have to live with live with it from there on. So I think that there, I don't know how discussions at this point that will inform the uh, cost estimate can can be entered into the process in a way that's meaningful. Um, uh, the last time I talked about uh, things like uh, the R factor, the, the double double glazing versus triple glazing, uh, the R factor of the exterior wall, the air tightness figures. Are, is there an established uh, number of air changes per hour in the in the specs that we're trying to hit? So that, that that is a very important variable. Um, um, particularly, um, I have a question about under slab insulation. We talked about. Uh, when there is no under slab insulation just at the perimeter. We're doing perimeter insulation, no insulation under the slab. That um, means that in some in some climate conditions, that means that uh, condensation on the slab is uh, potentially a problem. A cool slab in the right uh, the right summer conditions, and these buildings will not be all air conditioned during the summer. Um, could result in condensation. And so I think there is a moisture problem that is not addressed by uh, what we have now. The, uh, a large concrete slab touching the ground is cool and you can, in un-air-conditioned un 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 situations, get condensation, therefore mold and mildew. And I don't think that's, I think the decision not to insulate under the slab is an important one. It's a bad decision at this point. It's now this is the only chance we're going to have to insulate underneath the slab. Um, and it's a very, I think it's very important as far as into our air quality and, uh, and the health of the kids. And it's also good for uh, the slab to be a few degrees warmer um, in, uh, as far as a school is concerned, because a lot of kids, a lot of times kids spend a lot of time on the, on the floor. Lastly, um, well, lastly, I am concerned about the uh, curvilinear parking area at Wildwood. Um, it seems to me if we're going to build canopies over the, that parking, uh, the, the standard way it's done is rectilinear, not curvilinear. I think that's probably a decision that has to be revised, revisited. Lastly, I want to say just what you, other people have said, whatever you pick, I'm for it. Um, I think this is a difficult decision. I would tend to go with Fort River if I were if I had a, any authority here, but um, it is, I, I think your matrix is a great way of trying to figure out what the right thing to do. Whatever you pick, I'm for it. That's my message. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Tony is coming in. Tony Cunningham. Hi, uh, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. Um, thank you very much for posting the full cost estimates and phasing diagrams. It's great to get that detail. And my primary concern is that this project succeed and the override pass handily. Um, I'm concerned that any discomfort some of you may have felt today when trying to answer Phoebe's questions will only be multiplied when it comes time to ask taxpayers to voluntarily raise their taxes for this project. It has to pass an override. I would ask that you give some deep thought as to why you are leaning toward one site or the other and ask yourself if the community will agree with you when the vote comes up next April. Think about what is motivating your choice and what site is best for kids first and foremost. Consider these facts. Wildwood will be a construction site for a year longer. It will have no playground or fields for three years. When completed in summer 2027, it will have no playing field. There will be no room for the whole school community and families to gather for events like the multicultural affair that, fair that happened last week. There won't be enough parking for 175 cars for the first year the school is occupied, and you have not offered an alternative location. There is only one entrance for all construction vehicles and buses and cars, and when the school is complete, there would only still only be one entrance. And now there has been a suggestion that maybe you shouldn't bother with the roundabout. Construction at Fort River will be complete a year sooner. The two million higher cost for Fort River is for fabulous fields that are highly valued by residents, as you have heard, and CPA monies could be sought to help with that. There is more room to keep contractor lay down away from parking and kids at Fort River. And you told us that two story was going to be 10% more expensive than three story. These estimates indicate it is more like one and a half percent. Honestly, based on all that has been presented, I cannot see how anyone could pick Wildwood as a preferred solution here. 
it is clearly the inferior choice, and I expect it will be much more difficult to get an override passed for a Wildwood project. I would encourage you all to choose the better plan and the one that has the greatest chance of success. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And Pam Rooney's coming in. Sorry that sorry that took so long. It just it just spun and spun. Uh, thanks for letting me in. I had a couple questions that have to do with the uh, construction at Wildwood, and if if it was at all possible to go to that diagram again, it would be very helpful. Uh, this is looking at uh, the construction, and I'm I'm trying to figure out how do the well fields get constructed while the area is in use as a staging area. So I, I think Pam, we're trying not to do, it, you know, same way with Chris. So if you ask the question, what we can do is prepare answers for each. So that's, uh, uh, is, if that's okay with you, just to, um, so I'm making notes as is Margaret. Okay, and I, I suppose I could, I could email you that as well. The okay. second question I had is, is also uh, at Wildwood during phase two, um, it shows the, it shows the, the new building or the three-story building in place with some uh, playground area around it, yet the contractors are still on site and we know that um, we know that site construction and the final touches of playground areas are the absolute last thing that gets done. So still there would be no play area for the children. Um, uh, in that area. And I actually, I think um, Tony Cunningham said it far better than I could. It's, I, I'm very concerned that on Wildwood site, uh, that there is no, there is no real opportunity for children uh, outdoor space, um, given, given the parking needs for staff, given the parking and construction areas for contractors. So to me, it seems a little bit like an unsolvable puzzle. Thanks. Thank you, Pam. And Bruce Coldham is then brought in. Okay. Um, first of all, uh, like others, I just want to applaud uh, everybody, uh, Danisco and and uh, your uh, consultants. I think a, a really excellent job of uh, organizing the material and presenting it with clarity and being able to speak to it. And I do sympathize with Tim's dog. I'm sure he's been so busy that the dog's feeling neglected. <laughs> um, and the committee, your committee, uh, the, 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 you, the answers, the way you're proceeding and so forth is doing uh, justice to the excellent presentation and support from the design team and from uh, Margaret Wood and her team. So I continue to be impressed uh, with all of you in this. Um, I also, since I'm an architect and have been deeply involved in these sort of things for a while, I thought it might be worth uh, chiming in and saying that I agree with Rick and Tim and, and uh, uh, Donna about the uh, answers to Sean's very challenging question of uh, and Paul's to, uh, to a 50 year guarantee. Of course, uh, no one's really going to be able to do that. And apart from anything else, they're not going to be alive. So they could simply say, sure, it'll be fine and die happily long before the due date. Um, but from a professional point of view, I would share their, uh, the confidence that the uh, level of confidence and assurance that they gave us. I think it's, it's um, professionally supportable. I think what they're doing is intelligent. I had concerns about this site along with everybody else in town. My friend, uh, Terry Brennan, who diagnoses sick building syndromes and has done for 40 years, who's the leading expert in the country in this regard, was at Fort River and was, uh, so what is being done is all the things that Terry said couldn't be done because it was an existing building, but need to be done. So yes, I, I feel reassured uh, by their answers and by what's being done. Um, I do have some uh, more technical questions, which I will just send in by email. I'll also dive deeper into the data that's presented to see if I can't answer them myself. Um, finally, I, I actually tend, Chris, to disagree with you. 
um, about the substab installation. I know in the 90s, this was a, a requirement, a code requirement for school buildings, but I think that was before people thought and understood about the, how the physics of heat movement. If you put insulation down the perimeter of the building, uh, the, the heat flow through the soil tends to uh, be blocked by that perimeter. And, it, and, and the consequence is that the, the, the soil underneath the building equilibrates to the room temperature of the conditioned space. So theoretically, the slab shouldn't be needed, at least not all the way in and uh, comfort can be assured. I, I guess we could, I could ask John Straub and other building science experts on this matter, but I'm sure that um, Donna and her people have done the same. So I'm not as concerned as Chris is uh, based on my understanding of building physics and heat, heat transfer movement through soil that you need to spend money. But I think uh, we should be thoroughly reassured of that because it is going to be one of those residual concerns that the population has. And if someone hears there's no insulation under the slab, that could be a trigger that defies uh, um, science and, uh, and, and rationality. So although I agree with Chris, uh, disagree with Chris from the physics, I, I am somewhat uh, supportive of his concerns from a, from a popular cultural point of view. Thank you all very much. So I've allowed um, phone number 413-218-6922 to speak. Hi there, can you guys hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Maria Kopicki. Um, and a lot of what I was going to say has already been said, but um, I just want to reiterate, um, thank you once again for this presentation. Thank you to the amazing geotech people and thank you to our our uh, community architects who, who weigh in so so well about these things as well. Um, it's clear that that Wildwood is not going to have play space for kids for two years. And if even if you move in all 575 kids and all the staff for that third year, they're still not going to have play space, and it's going to be a construction site for another year. So it's 22. I'm sorry, sorry 26 months construction in the cost estimates versus 22. This is for new three story. Um, and it's really clear that Wildwood is just going to be a much more problematic construction site to the point where I don't know, maybe even construction manager at risk for this highly complex site would be warranted. On the other hand, Fort River is going to give you something that you simply absolutely can you cannot manufacture at Wildwood. It's going to have gorgeous fields and to improve multiple fields that are used not only by the kids and the school community, but the entire community for $2 million more is, I don't know, that's a no brainer. I think that that is exactly what you need to do. I'm confident that they will, uh, that the, the designers and the builders will use their state of the art um, expertise to make this a fantastic school in a fantastic setting in a part of the, the town that's going to have new developments with new residents living within walking distance. And we can and should invest in not only the school, but also in our, our streets and uh, in our fields. So please, please use Fort River. It will have resounding support in the community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. So Kathy, we have some uh, people have previously spoke that have their hands up again. I don't know if you want to um, do a second well, round I'm, of public comment or not. I'm conscious that it's after 1030. So I would, um, I well, would, there's one person who has not spoken. I, I don't think Rudy has been here yet. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And I ask if there, if the people have already spoken, if you just forgot to take your hand down, but if there are other questions, if you would just send them in or comments, it would be great. Rudy. I, yeah, thanks, uh, Rudy Perkins uh, in Amherst. Um, I won't take time to go through all the things that everyone has already said that I agree with that Fort River is just so much better a site. We're looking at a 2.2% increase in cost over new build three story um, on the DBB solution. And, and you're getting so much more at Fort River 
for that 2.2% that I, I just don't understand at this point how we could choose Wildwood. It's, it's just too complicated for the reasons given that there's no play space during two years and uh, so on and so forth. It's, um, I, I don't see it. You don't just look at what you pay for something. You look at what you get for what you pay for something when you're making investment decisions. And we get a lot more at Fort River. The um, clearing and grubbing uh, area in the Fogarty estimate looked to me like you're clearing and grubbing 18.3 acres in Fort River compared to, I think it's 8.3 at Wildwood, which gives you a sense of how much more land you're getting that could be used for different things. And that's not just playing fields. It's going to be future expansion options. It's going to be outdoor playing areas. If we have any geothermal issues in terms of the locations of the field, there's more flexibility in relocating them or spreading the wells further apart and so on. Uh, outdoor learning is much advanced there. There's more um, planned uh, investment in outdoor learning um, in the budget at Fort River in terms of the infrastructure there for that. So um, I, I just, at this point, I mean, I've waited, but uh, the cost difference is not enough to take us back to Wildwood, which just seems like a much inferior and problematic site, not to mention taking four months more minimum to, to build out. So you have disruption for longer, you've got everything compressed there. You don't have as good separation of the construction vehicles and the school vehicles um, at Wildwood during the construction based on the diagrams that were, were shown by um, Denisco. So um, I, I just hope we, we make the right decision here and go with Fort River. I think uh, we'll get community support. The extra money is a fraction compared to what we will get for the community over, over the long run. I just have one quick technical question I hope gets looked at again is that the photovoltaic panels in the budgets in the Fogarty were listed as 2,975 per kilowatt for the roof panels and only 2,800 per kilowatt for the canopy panels. And I thought it was gonna be the reverse, that the canopy panels were gonna be more expensive. The, also the amount of canopy panels in the later section of the budget are shown as equal between the two and the um, three story, and that doesn't jive with the number of panels shown for each of those two in the, the listing for the photovoltaic panels, at least in Wildwood. Um, so anyway, that, that's basically it. It sounds like there's a lot of support for going with Fort River, and I totally agree with that at this point. Um, the traffic engineers, I, I had some worries about that, but I just go back to the final line in the traffic report, the May 12th. In summary, we are of the opinion that the increase in traffic at either site can be mitigated to adequately accommodate the concerns of the town while maintaining traffic efficiency and safety. We'll figure out a way to do that. I think that's somewhat more problematic there, but it doesn't outweigh all the other advantages of Fort River to me. Thanks. Thank you, Rudy. And I think Everyone, there's still, is that the same phone number? Is that Yeah, I, I think that's the same number and the I hand's just still up. The hand is up, okay. So I think that um, concludes today's meeting um, and- Let me just double check, Kathy. I, I'm just gonna hit a lot yeah. of, I think it's the same number, but let me just yeah. confirm. Let me just, Maria, is this you again? Just the hand was still up, we're, we're trying to check. So I'll assume it is. Okay. So I, I think um, we can adjourn the meeting unless anyone has any last questions. So our assignment, um, Margaret will resend out the matrix with some suggested deletions, but you can be working with the one you've got that we're currently working with four point scale, as I understand it, and you could fill it out any way you want to with one, two, three, fours or with colors. Um, and we'll come in on Monday, try to go through at least the big ones where we see variations. So we're where we see big differences and then, uh, and then maybe narrow our options. 
So I, I do have, I have one question and I can ask that next week, but on two versus three stories, um, once we pick a site, does MSBA allow us leeway later to, to, to go from two to three or from three to two? So do we also need to, and I'll just ask that next Monday again, also Donna, um, I don't need to put you on the spot right now because it's a smaller difference than we thought it was gonna be. So I, I, so that is part of Monday's discussion as well. So, so I think that is it. And I'm not seeing any other hands. So I wanna thank the whole Denisco team, the answer team. Um, and I will see you all in a few days, Monday morning. Um, have a good weekend. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. And now I need to stop the recording. Stop recording.